So, um, hi, Lyndall. Thanks so much for joining me uh, today um, to talk about your work at Leamington Spa Art Gallery and Museum. Um, your work has played a really important part in the uh, current rehang that we have in the gallery, a picture of health. We've got several of your works on display and obviously um, you've played a really important part in uh, exhibitions and um, commissions at the gallery over the last um, decade. So it's really kind of you to be here today to talk about your work. Um, I suppose the best way to start is to, um, you know, if you can give me a quick summary of kind of your artistic career before your work at Leamington and kind of what interests you as an artist. Um, yes, so no thanks. It's great to be able to um, have you know contact with Leamington again whilst I'm in Australia. So it, it's it's wonderful. Okay, so uh, going back a while now, um, I guess there's one important thing to say is that my art practice wasn't particularly old when I came to the UK. It was still in its very early stages, and um, I, I found that I was whilst in Australia uh, working, I was really drawn to historical medical images. And I, you know, it took me a long time to realise why that was. But um, at, at the time I was doing a Master of Photography in Sydney. And interestingly enough, I, I did very little photography. I was basically gathering and, and researching these historical images. And then using very low um, technology image making, um, such as photocopiers, and actually making object-based work alongside those. So it was, quite, I suppose, a strange um, situation that you're doing MA photography and not actually doing any photography. But um, I, I spent a long time in various archives and, and libraries just gathering images. And they tend to be images where people their vulnerability was exposed um, and there was a, a kind of an action or a behaviour that was denied within the image. They, they tended to be mostly early illustrations, um, but I was also interested in, in photography from about the 1940s and, and 50s. So there were images of, of bandaged bodies, um, the masks came up quite a lot, um, various bracing on the body, um, yeah, so, so that, that, that's kind of a summary. And when I came to the UK, it, it was quite a natural progression that I, I just continued working with that material because that's what I had been used to. Well, so you mentioned the masks. So I suppose uh, a good place to kind of start with looking at uh, the various works that you've got in the gallery are these masks, which are um, silence that you made in 2001. And we've currently got them on display in the gallery. Um, they're, they're beautiful pieces. Um, if anybody hasn't seen them in person, they're, um, they're knitted and they're incredibly intricate, intricate designs. Um, so I thought uh, it would be a good place to kind of start to, to talk about these objects, kind of why you made them, what drew you to making them, and then um, and perhaps then looking at, you know, whether or not we're living through a, a, an age in which masks are everywhere, everybody's wearing masks, um, and so perhaps um, the way we look at this piece is slightly different from how we might have looked at it in 2001 when you, um, when you, when you made it. Definitely. The, the, uh, the masks were part of an exhibition in um, Alsager, the, the um, Manchester um, University, and the, the whole exhibition was around making objects that kind of played with the contemporary objects from medicine, such as various um, surgical dressings, the masks, surgical caps, and it was probably the first work I'd made that was devoid of that historical image, that they, it came very much from researching those, those objects now. So um, oddly enough, in relation to masks, I had uh, purchased um, all sorts of things from Johnson & Johnson um, without being biased to any company, but um, their medical supplies. So caps, gowns, blankets, um, the masks, um, so that I could kind of play with remaking those but using very feminine craft to do that. So um, 
again, weirdly enough, I, I bought a, bar, a box of the masks that everybody is is kind of wearing now, the, the one use masks, and then just kind of adapted the pattern of that to these masks. And then the other, the other influence came from a residency that I did in 1998 at the um, Museum of Modern Art in, um, in Dublin. Um, and I was specifically looking into prisoners and hard labour. And one of the things I was intrigued by was the hard labour that was given to women. And one of the most common tasks they were given was knitting. But it wasn't pleasurable knitting. <laughs> it, was, it was knitting in dedicated um, spaces that would have been cold. Um, the women were sitting in rows on hard benches. They weren't allowed to communicate with one another. The objects they made tended to be objects that then would be sold on by the prison. They were very much utilitarian objects. Uh, and sometimes they weren't even making objects, they were just told to knit for the sake of knitting for eight hours a day. So it was kind of combining the experience of discovering that information and my feelings to that, and then linking with these contemporary medical objects that I started to to kind of bring those, those two things together. Um, and then the other the kind of influence in this was that when I started looking at the colours that Johnson and Johnson were using, they were very, very kind of monochromatic. Um, and then I started thinking about minimal side and the use of colour. So I was really keen to make a work that when you first looked at it um, with the different monochrome colours, that it was very, um, kind of very contemporary in its feel, very minimal. But when you start to, as you alluded to, look at the way that they're made, uh, which is basically hand, stitching with very fine needles with embroidery thread. Um, and also the, the straps at the side are crocheted. And because I was kind of looking at this women's work, I actually asked my sister-in-law, who's a much better crocheter than I am, to make the, the white straps. So I, I like the idea that it was a combined effort by women within the piece rather than it, you know, just being made by me. Would but any would any of the women in the prisons have made face masks or were they making kind of different things and then you extrapolated that into the face masks? Yeah, they, they were making mostly um, kind of shawls, um, things that were kind of cheap uh, everyday objects in a sense, because uh, I, I don't, I'm not even sure where the face mask would have been around then. Um, I certainly, in terms of the imagery that I had relating to it, to an actual face mask that we would relate to today, it wasn't really until about the 1940s or 50s. Mm. Um, they definitely had masks for chloroform to, for people before operations, and they were hideous looking things. But in terms of the fabric mask, I think they're, they're quite modern in that sense. But I suppose that other part of your question in terms of how I, how I view them today, uh, it, it's been fascinating because it's a work that I have been thinking about a lot. It kind of pops into my mind, um, particularly last year when there was a there was just a lot going on about masks. Um, you know, certainly within Australia, there was it was for a long time before the governments here, both state and federal, actually thought that they were useful within the fighting against COVID. Whereas I know that the UK had been having and wearing them for a long time before they were introduced into Australia. Um, and then, you know, it, you can't help but think about all that was happening in America and the use of masks very much as a political statement as to whether you were for Trump or against Trump. So it, it, it's definitely taken on much more meaning um, than, than what it had in the past. And it, it's, it, it's great because it's just a good example of how different things that happen um, throughout the life of a work can, can influence how, it, how it's read and how it's, how it's perceived. 
So in 2010, you obviously did a project with the gallery, uh, which resulted in an exhibition called Touch. And we've now got several items of those uh, in the collection and on display in Picture of Health. So we've got your um, Touch slings and weights and um, Touch uh, electro uh, pads and um, also your uh, decorative commission, which is obviously um, permanently uh, in the gallery and in the kind of in the, the foyer and reception area of the building. And so I thought that obviously that's something that's going to uh, kind of form a key part of our, our conversation. Um, so perhaps we can talk about how that kind of project came about, how you, how you kind of first got involved with, with Leamington. Well, the first, I mean, we have to kind of go back 10 years again um, from 2010 to the first involvement and it was very much part of that exhibition that I had at Alsager that the, the person who was at the gallery then, Alison Plumridge, came up to see the exhibition because she was clearly you know, interested in that contemporary artist working with the history of medicine and they had just started the Medicaid collection so um, she came up, she saw the show and kind of contacted me pretty much as soon as she got back because um, I was living in Warwick at the time, so very close, and um, asked to come around and, you know, see me to talk about my work and then kind of said that they'd like to buy Silence. So um, that was amazing. I was quite shocked at the time. <laughs> and, uh, and then kind of 10 years later, um, basically, I, I, I just got an email out of the blue from Chloe Johnson at the gallery saying that it was 10 years since the beginning of that collection and that they wanted an artist to, to come and spend time at the pump rooms and to research the history of the pump rooms, the treatments that were done there, to look at the objects in the collection that relate to that era of the building. And then to come up with an exhibition that incorporated some of those historical objects and images alongside an artist's response to the material that they had been researching. So, um, so basically, yeah, that was the beginning of a wonderful time of just really kind of getting stuck into what was behind closed doors in Leamington. And it, it, it was kind of an interesting journey because I, I started off with what I with, with, with often call the, the dry material, so the kind of the, the basic historical nuts and bolts of, of the building and, and what happened there. Uh, and then I started looking at books that are, are in the, the museum's library that look at various medical treatments. And I still hadn't quite found what I often call is that little jewel that you find that just enables you to, to move forward with huge excitement. And it was, it was really a combination of two things. Um, the first was starting to physically see and handle the objects because, you know, for me, when you see those, you can understand that they had a contact with a human being. So it, it just makes them very realistic. And then the other, the other kind of missing jewel was um, finding that there was a whole lot of oral histories that had been recorded and that allowed me to hear patients and staff just talking about their experiences of visiting the space, the treatments that they had, how they felt. So it basically, once I had those, it was then working out how to start to pair those, those two things together. I think we've got some images of, uh, of some of the photographs and objects that you'll have been exploring. So, um, I think this is one of the uh, hydrotherapy pools at the gallery. Um, kind of how did you yeah, feel when you were kind of looking at these, these photographs? And, um, well, I th yeah, they're, they're a mix of, they're quite moving images. They're, they're very poignant. Um, people are in a potentially vulnerable state, again, when, when you know, through the treatments. Um, and the, the objects, you know, if you look at the photo that we have up at the moment of 
you know, all those contraptions hanging, they, they're slightly sinister <laughs> as well. Um, and I, again, I was naturally drawn to those, those objects that interacted with the body. So for example, with the, the slings and, and the weights, um, you can see at the bottom left-hand corner of the image that there's someone being suspended by the slings and um, so that would have been used to lower them into the water. And then the weights were used within various exercises so that they would be attached to pulleys and they would move limbs and, you know, they were similar to what, you know, using modern day weights in rehabilitation is, is now. So you can, you can see within this photo, there's an original weight bag and then there's the, the, the one of the ones that I've made in response. And, one of the things that, that really stood out to me was that a lot of these objects were actually made on site. It was a, a sewing department and a fabrication department. So uh, again, I love that idea of these, these objects being handmade in the location. But they were very utilitarian. They're not, they're not pretty objects. And one of the things that came out of the oral histories was people talked a lot about the beauty of the building, uh, the, the tiles on the walls, the, the marbling effects, the paintwork. And this is a image of the painted pattern on the walls of the hammam. And they, they very much talked about that decoration as making them feel comfortable um, and making them feel as though the space was one that they wanted to be in. And even as extreme as saying that it, it made it more of a healing space to have that, that beauty around them. So I, I knew that I wanted to make my objects start to kind of be imbued with the decorative that related back to the architecture of the building. So um, with the, the weight bags and the slings, I worked with a, um, a weaving company in Sudbury in Suffolk, and uh, they basically created a bespoke fabric for me that you know, is only ever going to be in Leamington um, on that hammam wall pattern. And the other element attached to the slings, because I've always loved the idea of objects that offer up something that is healing, but at the same time, there's something in that object that is slightly sinister or could deny that. So with all the slings, the actual hooks, which in, in the slings um, that were actually physically used were metal, the sling, the hooks in mine were all glass and very fine. So that if they were used, then it would be potentially disastrous for the patient <laughs> because the, the, the rings would just break and the patient would you know, have a fall. So um, I was very keen to have that ambiguity within some of those objects. So do you see your kind of time as Lemington, time at Lemington as um, as a kind of shift in your practice, you kind of talked about kind of being like quite, and I know you were making objects for Leamington, but you talk about being quite kind of object focused in your early career, but then perhaps becoming more kind of story and, and kind of history focused um, as, you, yeah. as you developed. Very much so. Um, history has always been something I have um, and still am. So that's definitely a common thread that's run all the way through my practice from 1993 till now. Um, and it's, it, it was definitely the first time that I had access to a collection. And that has been pivotal in that it enabled me to um, have access to this important collection to directly respond to it. But not only that, to actually include it within the exhibition. And so that's the first time I have done that. And there's, yeah, yes, there is a tradition of artists who occupy many different roles, um, artist, curator, researcher. And I think Leamington very much firmly sat me within that context and gave me the, the confidence to continue with that. So, um, you know, I, this long-standing relationship I have with Leamington, it has been a joyous one through the contact with the various people that have been there throughout, you know, that 20 year period. But 
I have an awful lot to thank Flemington for in terms of you know, purchasing the work, um, the mask work silence in the early 2000s was the first work I've ever had purchased, then giving me the opportunity with this exhibition. Um, I actually remember uh, when I got the email um, getting and was speaking to Chloe for the first time. And I actually said, um, have you offered this to other people? And they've said no, because I, you know, I knew the caliber of artists that were in, in the collection. And she said, no, we, you were the first person we went to. So, you know, I, I, I guess I was just really chuffed that, that the work that I'd been developing up until that point had been considered um, strong enough to be given this opportunity. Um, so, um, although you obviously were exploring the, the history of the collection, you did create some, um, it, well, in, cre in exploring the history of the collection, you obviously created um, several um, objects. And I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about, um, yeah, which I think you've spoken about a little bit already, but mm -hmm. perhaps we can delve into deeper about the, the process of making them. Because um, I think, am I right in thinking that you made some of them, but others were made kind of, are you... Yeah. Yeah, I, I made all the ones that, that I technically had the skills to do. Um, some of them, such as the electro pads, uh, I didn't have those skills. Um, so, um, and the towel, actually, if we just flip back to the towel, that's one that um, I didn't have the skills. Um, well, it's just kind of, um, if you, we go back a bit further to the white towel. Yeah, the, yes, hit this one here. Um, what, one of the things that came out, and I will actually, um, which is from one of the staff uh, that I found in Lower History, and she was talking about the towels. We used to wrap them in warm towels, quite big warm towels, tuck them up neatly and they'd lie on the bed with a blanket over them. And the towels came up a lot. They had a, a warming cupboard that was within the space. Um, the pool area and other areas and towels and they had apparently they were these lovely big towels and they would put them in there and get them nice and warm so that when people were having their treatments or coming out of the, the treatments within the pool they would be wrapped in these warm towels and and the, the patients talked about just the comfort of being just encased in this soft warm towel afterwards so so I was very keen to, to have a have a towel um, but I wanted to go through that commercial route of a proper woven towel, the same as what you know you would buy in a shop. Mm. But I also wanted to make a towel that was completely exaggerated in scale. So again, it had a slightly menacing threat to it. Yes, it could warm you, but it could also suffocate you and strangle you at the same time. And I guess the reason I was, you know, I've often been fascinated by objects that have dual functions where you look at it and it might be one thing, but actually there's something darker underneath. And um, again, listening to the oral histories, there was a lot of people who were terrified to come into the space. They, they didn't know what was gonna to happen to them. Nothing was explained to them. They didn't know what was happening to them when they were there. Um, and they just didn't enjoy being there. So I, I, I kind of wanted to get across a bit of that uneasiness within some of the works. So that you had the the sense of the the comfort from the decoration of the building, but also mixed with the slightly darker, more uncomfortable feeling. Um, so yes, yeah, so this one, uh, in terms of fabrication, I got a textile company in Lancashire to make the towel, and then they hand embroidered the the pattern onto both ends, which is the tile pattern that was on the ladies' pool. I mean, if we, yeah, sorry. No, 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 continue, please. I was going to say, if we flip through to the, the next one, which I think is the blanket. Oh, no, this one, yeah, this is, well, yes, we can talk about the blanket. The blanket, um, and again, I'll read you another quote, because this, uh, this woman, Catherine Wilkins, she was amazing. Um, I loved listening to all of her, her stories. She she was one of the people who loved coming to the pump rooms and it was a social occasion for her. Her husband always came with her and he'd always have tea in the tea rooms and chat up the, the waitresses. And she, she was just joyous. Her whole voice was joyous. And, and I, 
previous to listening to her oral history, when I'd been looking at the objects, I'd found, well, had been shown these pair of metal glasses. They were heavy metal rims with wire mesh across the eyepieces. And I remember Vicky at the time saying that they didn't know what they were for. They weren't even overly sure they were from the medical collection. So I was fascinated by them and I was kind of thinking, well, I wonder what these were for. And then I heard this piece within the oral history. You were on a bed and they lined all the wall with some foil, a big sheet of cooking foil. And then I had some steel glasses on, those steel glasses. I can remember them now. Very thick, heavy ones with all little wires across. So she perfectly described the glasses that were in the collection. So I knew that for, for Catherine, I wanted to have the glasses sitting alongside a, a blanket made of foil, but instead of just a sheet of foil wrapped over her, I felt that she deserved a very beautiful handmade blanket. Um, so this was the work that probably took the longest to make in that it's the size of a single blanket. Um, it was all hand knitted with the exception of the strips that run across. They are actual metallic ribbon, but the, the body of the piece was all made from hand knitting foil. And there was a lot of experimentation to work out what foil to use, because I started trying to use baking foil, but it didn't have any give and it just kept snapping. So after trying lots of different foils and getting quite frustrated, uh, one of my colleagues at work said, why don't you try her hypothermia blanket? because they're made of foil and they're quite soft because they wrap around and she had been running marathons. So she, she kind of knew what they were like and how they felt. So I just, I bought one and it was absolutely perfect. It had enough give in it to be able to knit with it, but they come in a, a small blanket size and clearly to make a single bread on a bed cover, I needed a lot of it. And you can't buy it in a, you know, in a ball of foil. So I used to, I had to hand cut each length um, to I think about a centimetre wide. And then when I was knitting, I think each section was about one and a half metres long each length. Um, I don't know how many foil blankets I went through. So there were probably thousands of individual strips. And I would actually sit and knit with du double-sided tape. So whenever I had to join one, I'd just put the two ends together with double-sided tape and then knit again and then put, put it together again. So it was, um, it was quite interesting. And I was also knitting it during summer. And those, they, they do, they're very effective. They keep you warm. And um, I was finding it quite uncomfortable because I was kind of getting overly hot just knitting this blanket. Um, so yeah, it's, it's actually my favorite work from the show. And it's, I think it's very much because it has, I guess my trademark, ridiculously labor intensive making. Um, with an object that's very beautiful. Um, I'm definitely an artist who's not afraid of using the word beauty um, with their work. And then just having that lovely association back to Catherine and also being able to find out what those glasses were used for. So I felt I'd helped a little bit with the research of the collection. Definitely. Um, so obviously, I mean, as, as you can see, see from every single, every single caption, touch was central to this, to this okay. exhibition. And um, I just wondered if we could talk a little bit, I'm gonna go back to um, an image of the show here. Um, if we could talk a little bit kind of about kind of the actual experience of going to the exhibition, how it was curated and perhaps kind of, was there an irony in the fact that- Yeah, there was. <laughs> it's all about touching and then you couldn't, nobody could actually touch the objects. Yeah, there was an irony there, and and um, and the touch touch came out very much because the the healing process within the pump rooms was very hands on. So you know the the the, the staff were hands on with their patients. It, it it kind of it it was something where that that image, I guess, of the hand coming into contact with the body for treatment was very common. So the, the title came from that, but then, you know, sadly, <laughs> we're dealing with an exhibition space and collection objects um, and artworks that generally are not allowed to be touched um, by people. So I do know that some people that came to the show were quite frustrated um, that 
the show said touch because I think they thought they could come in and touch everything and then they're told by the invigilator that they're not. Um, so yes, there was an irony there, but um, but I perhaps I was a little bit naughty, but if I was ever in the space and engaging with somebody, I'd certainly let them touch my work. Um, and you know, if they looked like they'd be respectful, they could very gently touch a collection object at the same time. Um, but again, you just, you couldn't just have a blanket people can go and touch or else um, there would have been some very nervous curators. Yes. <laughs> And then, I mean, we talked about kind of viewing silence in a slightly different light because of the, the pandemic. And I was wondering if you view any of these objects slightly differently. Um, you know, touch being something that we've not really been allowed to do for the yeah. last 18 months. Yes, it's true. I mean, again, it would be interesting for that show to be now, in a sense, just, just to know what people would would feel about that. Because touch is definitely something that, has disappeared um, and it, it's it, one of the things that I got very comfortable with in the UK when I lived there was uh, the, the shaking of hands. Um, I never fully got comfortable with the hugging thing because um, Australians don't really do that and I got overly confused with you know whether it's kind of one kiss on one cheek or two or three are you French or, or whatever so I got I got very confused but Handshaking I loved because it was very obvious what, what you had to do. And, um, and, and when I came back here in 2019, I was really heartened that it's, it was something that people tended to do more here than what they used to. So it, again, it felt really comfortable. So to kind of have that completely denied during COVID for me was, was really strange because it had been this behaviour that I had kind of embraced and and, and and then it, it, it just wasn't there and because you continue to kind of meet new people it's just often very strange that there's not a, a physical form of engagement and I don't really get this elbow thing that that people <laughs> go on with. it just it just looks a bit odd um but yeah but you know it has been like one of the projects I'm working on now which I'll talk about at the end uh even even during COVID because they're a, quite a remote village you know, they would shake my hand. And that was actually the first time someone had shaken my hand since I left Britain. And it, it was just wonderful. I just, I wanted to give them the hug, but I couldn't because it's COVID. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I, I think people would, maybe people might be more tolerant. I don't know. Because I do remember some of the comments in the visitor's book that, you know, people were just not happy that they couldn't touch things. So perhaps there might be a bit more of an understanding about that now. Um, yeah, I, people, I guess. people yeah. like to touch things. Um, so obviously that at the centre of this exhibition was was uh, the kind of remaking or or um, reimagining objects mm -hmm. uh, or parts of the objects in the history collection or or kind of responses to the building. And um, as and you talk a lot about history and memory and, and fact and fiction in the description of your your practice and this exhibition. And so I was just um, wondering if you could talk a little bit more about kind of how you think reimagining these historical objects as contemporary art kind of helps us to understand these histories and experiences better rather than just, for example, say, having the having the historical object on display. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure whether understanding is, is, is maybe the right word, uh, but it's, I think what an artwork can do is it just can make people think a bit more laterally um, and I think it it can add potentially more emotion to something actually it's, it's quite interesting that you should ask me this because it's a I, I've been writing a paper for my doctorate and it's kind of the core of, of what I'm writing about at the moment so it's, it's very kind of topical for me and um, but I've been looking at it in, re in relation to kind of sci art and artists working in the science field of, of which medicine obviously is and i think you know that now there's been an awful lot of writing from various academics and and people that are interested in sci art that i think pretty much agree that that artists just have that that kind of scope um, and desire to to bring feeling and emotion into 
work that can be seen as maybe a little bit clinical and a little bit cold. So, um, I mean, I think, but, but saying that, um, and maybe I'm, I'm kind of, because I'm attuned to these things, I think the, ob the historical objects anyway say a lot from the collection. Um, I think they're, and particularly the way they're displayed within the gallery spaces with the images as well, I, I think people would be moved when they experience those. So, so, the, so the artwork just kind of adds another layer to that. And, and I, I kind of think there's something about having the two in dialogue with one another because it's a, just a slightly different reading of that one subject or that, or that one theme. Um, and and it, it kind of, it's, it's probably, there's more layers of meaning. So if you look at the historical object, it has a function, it has a, you know, generally a singular meaning. But when you look at the artwork, such as example, the slings here, you know, you've got the link back into the architecture, you've got back into the oral histories, you know, the use of the glass for the fragility. So it's, it's much more multi-layered and not everybody is going to read all of those things and, and they shouldn't have, you know, need to have to. But, you know, I always think if I can make someone stop for a period of time and linger with a work, which might make them think then or feel, or that might happen later, then, you know, it's successful. Because I, I love the idea that a work will, will sneak up on someone, you know, that they might be the next day doing the washing up and all of a sudden they'll go, ooh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I get that or that, yes, that made me feel a certain way. So I kind of, I think artists can, you know, they have that scope to, to just mix it up a bit and to broaden readings, really. I mean, it's, yeah, there's, there's lots of different things I could say there, but I won't go on too long. <laughs> well, I suppose, um, so in your relationship with Lemington, um, obviously you created these objects to, to explore the, the history of the medical object in the collection mm. but you also um came back again in 2017 i believe to um to create some work that uh, helped perhaps uh talk about or, or make more obvious to people the the history of the building and so i thought we should um just spend a little bit of time yeah. talking about the yeah. decorative commission that you made so if i go through and people can see a few more images of your work from the exhibition whilst we go Yes, again, the, the decorative commission, you know, came out of the blue, <laughs> um, which was wonderful. And basically, it was just that the, the council wanted to, to kind of make the, the entrance to the pump rooms more appealing, more welcoming, um, to potentially soften the architecture, because I think the the glass extension that was put on the buildings when the pump rooms were converted. It's, it's quite kind of hard and it's quite brutal. And so I think, you know, there was definitely a wish on, on the council's behalf and, and the staff who worked at the pump rooms to, to have something that was just eye-catching when people walked into the space that, that gave an introduction into the history of, of the building. And, and the other thing actually which, which came out once I started was to try and link the building to its environment, which is the park, so that there wasn't such a, a kind of a, you know, barrier between glass front and park that they started to kind of merge a bit more together. So, so that was kind of the origins of it. And I think Lamington always knew that they, they wanted something in vinyl on, on the windows. So that was a given. Um, which for me was exciting because I had done some smaller works in permanent commissions in vinyl uh, for buildings that were internal and had kind of been on the lookout really for a large scale piece where the, the vinyl a decorative element was on the exterior so that it could play with the light and connect to the outside environment. So it, it kind of you know, it offered also something that I was particularly looking for at the time. So it was, it was a good marriage, so we say. And I guess because I had that extensive knowledge of, of the collection, I, it, was, it was kind of very 
straightforward to come up with what the imagery would be. And the reason um, I was interested in the tiles then, but also in 2010, is that now you think of the size of the building and the amount of very beautiful decorative tiling that was in the building, all that remains after the redevelopment was done is, I think it's either 12 or 13, it was a long time ago since I counted them, but 12 or 13 shards of tiles such as, such as this image. And I just felt that was just a huge shame that there hadn't been some consideration given at the time to try and keep some of those decorative elements and, and maybe recite them in the building somewhere. So because I knew that the building had been much loved and that people were very, very passionate about the decorative detailing that was in the building, it, it was, dare I say, a no-brainer brainer as to what the imagery had to be. Um, and coupled with that was the fact of the use of blue in a lot of was was again an, another factor into it. So that's out just then, Lyndall. Can you repeat what you said? Sorry. Oh, sorry. It was um, basically the 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 blue colouring of the tile mm -hmm. and how just by using blue you you basically kind of link back into the the outside again to the sky. And actually one of the, the really lovely comments that I've had back from feedback from people that have come to, you know, and seen the work is apparently there's, there's a, a regular visitor and, and um, one day she said to one of the staff that since the work went up, every day she comes into the space, the sun is shining. And I just, I just kind of thought that's a lovely comment. So the, um, that one tile pattern went on the, the glass in three different shades of blue. And then I was always keen to put something onto the white wall that um, is now behind the visitor's desk. At that time, the visitor's desk was in, in another location. But it was just a, a wall that was sort of devoid of anything. It, it just didn't have anything about it that was appealing. And it was very bitsy. There were lots of kind of different things on it. So it was a chance to, to kind of make that give a feature to that wall. So I, I kind of went with the hammam pattern again and played with the, the fabric that I met, that I had woven, which was a combination of a shiny thread and a, and a matte thread, which gave that sense of you know, depth to it. So um, we basically chose, well, I chose that pattern and then it was cut in a glossy white vinyl onto a matte white wall. So it had exactly that same kind of quality as the fabric had. And then we decided to extend part of that into the, the entrance gallery space as well, so that it connected through. Um, and, it, you know, again, it was a, a great experience because, you know, this is, you know, one of the largest works I've ever made. So, again, Leamington was just offering me a, a situation that was, was perfect timing and, and something that was really important to me. So, um, yeah, so that, that's kind of the, the background to it. Yeah, I suppose that um, that visitor's comment about the the sun shining when when yeah. you go into the space kind of really um, brings together a lot of different kind of themes in your work about kind of memory and space and how those mm -hmm. how those two things kind of work together and the way in which kind of you know architecture um, and and the kind of decoration of a space can can make a person feel and can shape their their experience not just of of medicine but kind of of, of any um yeah. place that they might go to um and so and also too i i'm i'm just such a huge believer in a work being completely bespoke for place that you know if you're going to make a work for any location it has to be so embedded in, in that location and it has to reflect that. And if it doesn't, then I don't think it's, I don't think it's successful. Mm. Um, and it's, it's kind of really, I suppose, why I love working kind of out, outside your classic, um, you know, white cube gallery space. So, you know, I'm very much drawn to working with organisations that sit outside the arts and making works that will go into spaces that are not a gallery space because, 
you know, it, it's, it's, it's really quite an exciting thing to do. And actually, the one thing I should have mentioned, the other aspect of this commission was the coffee mug multiple that we yes. created. And again, that, that was a fantastic opportunity because um, it, it kind of meant that I, I kind of went into merchandising, which was just really good fun. And I, and I also loved the idea that people could take a bit of the gallery home with them and a bit of the building home with them. So, you know, they, they could live with it in a really cheap way. You know, they, they weren't paying a lot of money and it was an object that they would use on a, on a daily basis. So, um, so yeah, it, the, the, the two kind of went hand in hand and I love the idea of the big scale of the installation with the small scale of the, of the coffee mugs. Um, and oddly enough, and it's, I always find that with projects, they go in themes, like you kind of have one thing happens and then the next thing that happens is kind of interlinked. And the project that was happening kind of around the same time as, as doing the, this and the, particularly the, the, the coffee mugs were the Heritage um, Centre in Derbyshire, where I created a, a series of six china plates. So it was, it was kind of interesting. And the same pottery in Stoke who did the plates did the mugs. Uh, so it, it just opened up a whole new window of me, for me of, of, of ways of working and, and, and what the artwork could be. Um, there's actually, <laughs> I can't see it, I don't know whether that's kind of one of the, one of the plates mm -hmm. here, which, sorry, showing things on screens probably doesn't work, but that's just kind of a little detail of, of one of them. But um, so, yeah, so it was, it, again, it was another great coincidence of something happening that then had this after effect. Yeah. Leamington does that to me. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good thing. It's, it, well, we've, we've thoroughly enjoyed having and, and continue to enjoy having your works um, around us when, um, when we can be in the building. Um, I suppose your discussion about kind of space and, and creating bespoke art for different places, depending on on kind of the different their different histories leads us really nicely to the kind of uh, what we're going to discuss just at the the end of this conversation, which is um, what you're currently working on, um, which I think is a, is a project in in Australia, isn't it? Yes. Um, so if we ah uh, yes. Um, so if we yeah if we go back to the first the first image, I'm sure that. Um, nearly everyone in Britain is aware of the horrendous fires that Australia had in the 2019-2020 summer. Um, it was on the news all around the world, I think, and um, the number of my friends who contacted me to see if I was okay, I'm quite sure that, you know, people were aware of it. And um, one of the things I've always felt with working with communities is that it actually is a real privilege to get to know a a community and to be able to to kind of make work that we can share um, that has meaning for them and so I was invited by Arts Northern Rivers to work with a village called Ratville which is actually quite close to the town that I was born and grew up in and Ratville was one of the first villages that were devastated by fire at in the sort of late end of 2000 October actually it was the 8th of October 2019 and um, at least half of the houses were destroyed. Uh, a lot of fires over here happened with ember attacks from fires that are a little bit further away but Ratville had the whole impact of the fire go through the village um, and sadly two people died and there was just massive destruction. Um, so to spend time with those people has been incredibly moving and I at no point have I ever asked <laughs> about the fires because I think that's a very personal experience that people go through but it is amazing the number of people that just very generously talk about it um, and you know there, there are a lot of people that are dealing with a lot of just a lot of trauma from what they've experienced um, so so basically, um, my role has been to, to get to know the community, to spend time with them, and then to come up with some works that 
that kind of are meaningful to people in rap world. So um, the image on the right links very much back to the founding origins of Rapville. It was, a, is, was, is, will be a timber town. And this is the first mill that was in Rapville in the early 1900s. And then, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm working with a bush poet uh, who lives locally to there. And actually next Wednesday, we're going to have a workshop with the community to come up with a, a poem that will basically re reveal how, um, what trees mean to the people of Ratville. And that's, it's a whole number of things. Obviously timber has been important. It's a financial lifeline for the village, but it's, there's also tea tree oil um, is produced there. Trees have been used to commemorate various key things within the history of Ratville, such as the soldiers who were killed in the First and Second World War, and to honour the early settlers to the area. Um, and there's also um, beauty. Uh, so many people are uh, in, you know, just at, on a daily basis, they're just reminded that there are these beautiful Australian trees that, that surround the village. And so many of them got destroyed uh, during the fire. And I, the first person that ever spoke to me about the fire and I, and I made the comment that, you know, essentially it's down to the trees being so close to Rathville that, that created the fire because that, that brought it into the, the village. And Roger very quickly just looked at me and said, the trees were victims too. And that, that just really stayed with me that there is just this really strong emotional connection to trees. So essentially we're, we're creating a poem which will then be turned into a visual that will be a permanent piece within the village. Um, and then if we move on to the next, um, I've, I've realised through talking to people that they are incredibly passionate about their history. Most of the community, well, all of the community are very hardworking, lower to middle class families. There are a number of families that have been there for generations, so they are incredibly proud of where they've come from. And so I've been gathering historical images that will be showcased when we have our final event in October um, in, in banners that will be then bequeathed to the village so that they can choose to display those whenever they want. But my, my jewel, I talked about the oral histories and the um, objects being the jewel of Leamington. The jewel of Ratville has been finding what is on the right, which is this tablecloth that was created in the First World War when the Red Cross decided that they wanted to raise funds for the war effort. And so people paid a small donation to write their name on the tablecloth and then later it was embroidered by ladies in the village. And I discovered this photograph in a, a local historical society and contacted key people in the village. And there was really only two people in the village that had any memory of it. And thankfully, one of those knew who owned it. Um, and since me kind of discovering this photo, the, the village has now been able to have it come back to Ratville. And I actually saw it in real time uh, yesterday for the first time. Um, and it is incredibly beautiful. So um, I'm going to recreate that event and I'm calling for the people of Ratville today to put down their signatures and I will design um, a new tablecloth for them for 2021, which will be printed so that we can have multiple copies so that there will no longer just be one and people will know exactly kind of, you know, where tablecloths are. And I, you know, my hope is that in another hundred or so years time, someone might repeat it and, and do another one. So um, yeah, it's been a real privilege to, to work on Ratville and to get to know the people there. Amazing. So if we move, yeah, sorry. Ah, so the, the, the last image relates to my doctorate and it, it oddly enough also relates back to the UK and I'll be kind of quite brief with this, but before I left Australia to move to the UK in 1999, I wasn't that kind of overly interested in nature and landscape. Um, I was too busy focusing on medical history and when I got to the UK, 
nature just opened up for me and and I think because it's so accessible in the UK, um, it's very gentle, it's easy to be in, you don't have to worry about anything killing you or dying of heat stroke. So um, I, I just developed this huge love for nature when I was in the UK and a lot of my work started to deal with that as a subject matter. So when I, sorry, <coughs> when I came back and kind of started in the doctorate, I knew that I wanted to, to just kind of reacquaint myself with Australian flora and fauna so that I could appreciate it as I had in the UK. So um, I've been, um, there are two kind of parts to the doctorate. One is to research women who were amateur in their field, who collected or were involved with the collecting of um, bird and plant specimens in the 1800s. And alongside that, uh, working with contemporary ornithologists and botanists in, that, in those fields today. So the images that you can see are, uh, the one on the left is an image by Elizabeth Gould, and some people may have heard of John Gould, who was the famous kind of famous bird man basically uh, and he was British but he wrote the first ever book on Australian birds that was hugely famous Australian ornithological history was completely dominated from Britain by Gould uh, for most of the 1800s and his wife Elizabeth was one of his illustrators in fact it, she was pretty much his main illustrator until sadly she died in 1841 um, and she's pretty much been forgotten about. Very few people know about her. So I was very keen to kind of find these women who had been lost in history. And then the image in the middle is, connects to, well, it's a gentleman called Sylvester Diggles who wrote the first ever Australian book on birds. And his niece, Rowena Burkett, worked with him to do the hand colouring of the plates. And again, she's completely, and, and so was Sylvester Diggles, dropped out of Australian knowledge. And then the plant on the right is, um, I discovered that there was a man called Ferdinand von Müller, a German who was the person who started the first herbarium in Australia. And he always hoped to write the first book of flora for Australia. But sadly, he knew to do that. He'd have to go back to Kew and he never wanted to go back to Europe again. So um, that went to, the album went to somebody else. But as part of building the herbarium and his research in order to, to hopefully write that book, he set about collecting as many Australian plant specimens as he could, which is, you know, it's a vast country, vast number of specimens. So he knew he couldn't collect all those himself. So he had a network of around 3,000 collectors around Australia who collected for him, mostly if they were amateurs. And this was really in the, the second half of the 1800s. And he also targeted women, and there were around 200 women um, throughout Australia who collected and so I was specifically looking at the women and I was focusing on the women in Queensland of which I think there was about 47 and then there were five women who collected specimens in the area where I grew up and where I now live so it's it's kind of it's those five women that I've, I'm really focusing mostly on and have an exhibition at a regional gallery next year about the work that will come out of that so so kind of once again, I'm still dealing with history <laughs> and I'm, I'm just still dealing with, with kind of lost histories in a way, um, things that have, you know, that are not to the fore and just kind of discovering these objects or these images and then just bringing them back again um, for people to consider. Well, thank you so much, Lyndall, for um, for talking to me and for giving um, such a wonderful overview of your work at Leamington and and now your your kind of um, continuing practice. I hope it's really provided a um, further information, a kind of a greater context for people visiting the gallery and perhaps people who haven't been to the gallery yet to see your amazing uh, pieces will be um, encouraged to, to come and see them and, and spend time in the, in the place that they, they were made and that they you know, relate so closely to. So um, thank you so much um, for, for talking to me. My pleasure. And again, thank you for allowing me to have this wonderful continued relationship with, with Leamington. It's, um, I couldn't be more happier. Thank you so much.